she was one of the people who created camp. And I figured, let's camp it up if we're going to do it in the studio. Then let's phony it up, like let's make it fun, let's let her give her head, let her do what she wants, because I already had her on film, I felt, as I saw her. So why not? And if that's what she wanted, that's what she was going to have. And this was, she was really going back into the time when she'd been happiest which is in the early 50s, doing these cheesecake photographs. And when she arrived, her eyes were like saucers. She was only an hour late, which was rare. And she said, this is at the end of the day, she said it again, but at the beginning she said it looked wonderful. And then at the end of the day, she turned to Whitey and she said, we've never had it so good. But early in the day, when he started to make her up, she said, why do you remember when we started she said, look at all of this, but in those days we had hope. Which was crushing for me to hear this. Uh, it told a great deal about the inner turmoil of the woman, and it was painful to hear. After she died, there was a set of pictures that Bert Stern had taken of her, and they were wild and almost out of control when he shot them. I don't know whether she was uh, hyped up from sheer excitation or whether she'd been drinking or what had happened to her. But she was absolutely wild during that session. And they were semi-nudes, uh, nudes with uh, scarves, diaphanous scarves that she was playing with. And she hated most of, a great many of those pictures. And she had agreed that she, she would go through them and that they would have to go along to her choices. And in the end what happened was that uh, Bert Stern sent her only about a third of the pictures and what she returned to them were, had been gouged with some kind of a sharp instrument, a hairpin or something like that. And she hated them. And in the end he used them in his book. And I, I feel that that kind of invasion, if somebody lends you their face, I think you owe them the courtesy of trying to make them, you know, you don't have to flatter them, you don't have to retouch them, you don't have to do any of that. But I do think you owe them the courtesy of having them look as well as they could. And I suppose for me, and maybe one of the reasons that I finally decided to do this book was the ultimate in, in horror for me of what can happen to a picture. The, uh, in the Summers book, he uses the picture taken of her in the morgue, and that hurt, because all of us who worked with her and respected her and loved her, cared about her, wanted her to come off as, 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 as nice, as intelligent, as wonderful as she was, and it hurt when that was used. Is that one of the reasons why you decided to publish the book now? Yes, I think it was one of the reasons. There, but also, during the past few years, I didn't want to exploit the material. I, some of the material, about 20% of what's in the book, was used, and that was already in the files of the Magnum agents in their own offices in Paris and New York. And, but everything else, I embargoed when she died and put it away. And I really didn't want to, first of all, I didn't want to do it because I didn't want to believe that she was dead. So, and it was painful. And it was interesting that when I finally did decide to do the book, it was not painful because I found all the material of the contemporary material, the contact sheets, my own notes of each session. In reading it, I started to remember the joy in the early sessions and the fun, and it became a kind of loving reminiscence of her. It could be said that you're exploiting her memory as well. Yes, I guess it could be said. Um, except that my reason um, was selfish. I wanted to figure out who she was and what she was. It was that. Uh, it was also the business of wanting to put a few facts straight. Not that I think that it'll have any influence when they're 604 books who say differently and one person makes a mistake and the other th 603 pick it up. No, I think you can say that I'm exploiting it. I hope not vulgarly and not nastily. Yes, I think we all used her. I don't think there's any question about that. I think as a photographer, 
uh, one has to accept the fact that one does invade other people's privacy. And however, you could argue that without the still camera, Marilyn would not have been Marilyn. We would not have seen her, because that's the way most people saw her, unless they saw her films. And they wouldn't have gone to see the films if the publicists hadn't built in this character. So it's a circular thing. I don't quite know how to, how to explain it, beyond the fact that we all used each other. She used me to help her to get where she was going, me and hundreds of others. You know, I was not unique in that. Unique only in the fact that she trusted me. You see, the thing that was, was interesting is that she would be late, she would be difficult. She was with that press conference with Laurence Olivier uh, when she kept him and Terence Radigan sitting out in a little sofa, pictures of these two men sitting with, gritting their teeth in an ante room at the Waldorf while she was getting ready. And she had asked me to come up and see her before she started. And she was already an hour late. Uh, I didn't want to come, and then she sent a publicist, and I came up, and she said, uh, watch me in the mirror. I said, you look great. And at 11 o'clock in the morning, she had on this black velvet gown with tiny sort of spaghetti straps and a velvet coat and a sort of lovely uh, sheer scarf around her neck and blonde against this black and the white skin. And finally she came down and they posed on a balcony at the Wilder and then they walked down and she was caught in this great crowd and then they sat down at a table. And Olivier uh, picked up the microphone, this big hand mic, and he started talking into it and answering questions for them, making the announcement that they were going to be doing The Prince and the Showgirl in England. And the next thing was that uh, he would answer questions. It was all very serious and pontificating. And then suddenly, Marilyn leaned back, pushed her coat back, leaned forward and broke one of the straps and the whole place went mad. And safety pins were handed and laughter was heard and she had the microphone. It was her show. But that was, I'm sure it was premeditated, after which she was very angry when people asked her if she'd planned it. I think she did. The last time that I photographed Marilyn, she had called from the hospital early on when I had met her when we'd gone to Bement, Illinois. She had had an illness, a kidney ailment, which doctors describe as an ailment of women who are fair, fat, flatulent, and 40. And she was precocious because she was 28 when she got it. And then in her 30s, she was operated on. And she called me from the hospital and said that there was a woman's magazine, I think it was called Good Housekeeping, that wanted to do a story on Mrs. John Kennedy's hairdresser, who was called Kenneth. And the article was called Mrs. Kennedy's Kenneth. But since he was also Marilyn's hairdresser, would I come and photograph Marilyn? And she looked wonderful. She'd just gotten out of the hospital. She'd slimmed down. Kenneth had done a kind of wonderful sweeping hairdo for her. And it was just laughter and pleasant. And uh, I photographed her. And that was the last time. And I only used about a half a roll of film because it was all there. There was no point in going on. And she was tired and just come from the hospital. That was the last time I photographed her. But there was a time when she called after that. I was living in London at the time. And I'd just gone back to New York. And I was at home in the country. And she called and she said she was going to sing happy birthday to the president. John Kennedy was then president. And I had just come in, I was exhausted. And I knew what it would be, me dancing attendance and coming in first and she would come in with lots of other people. And I was tired and I thought there was nothing I could add to everything I'd done. And I said, Marilyn, I think not. And I've always regretted it, because I think it might have been nice to have seen her that once when she sang in that breathy voice of hers. But that was it. <laughs>